Uh, so mark that down in your, in your brain there. And uh, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Daniel chapter 7. Speaking of sevens, we have a lot of sevens tonight. That's good. Daniel chapter 7 uh, is where we are as we're working our way through the Bible. On Wednesday nights, we work through the Bible. This is where we are tonight. So let's pray and ask God to bless it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. And Lord, look forward to communion tonight, a time just to remember your body and your blood and what you've done for us. And Lord, to get into Daniel chapter 7 and get further insight, Lord, into um, the future, the kingdoms of the world, and, and what you would say to our hearts tonight. Again, we pray for your continued mercy on the nation of Israel, Lord. We think of the hostages uh, that are being held now, that you would release them and keep them safe and have mercy on them and their families um, as they suffer during this time. And again, just open your word to us, God. We pray you would be our teacher tonight, and we look forward to what you have for us in your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm jumping right in because this is a communion night. I want to leave time for prayer and for things at the end. Um, so I want to do one chapter tonight, but it's kind of a long chapter, a lot of stuff in it. But we went through Daniel a while back as a body, so we won't have to be quite as bogged down on this, so to speak, as getting into the, the minutia. But there's a lot of details regardless. Um, it, it's important to remember now, as, as you go through the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2, God spoke to Daniel and gave him the vision of uh, and Belteshazzar, or Bel I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, and then gave Daniel the interpretation of uh, the kingdoms, the four major kingdoms of the world up until the second coming. Now, there have been more than these four kingdoms, but the four major kingdoms that God wanted to talk about up until the second coming, uh, all four of them have happened except for the last leg of the fourth kingdom. If you remember, it has two legs. It's the Roman Empire. It will be revived in the last days. It really has kind of always existed in the background. Roman Empire was never defeated. It kind of just faded. So there's still a flavor of the Roman Empire. It's going to, it's going to rise back up and be stronger than ever here um, uh, very soon. And so uh, that's what we'll be looking at tonight. As we work through here, what's important to remember is not just that it's those four kingdoms, but what God shows Daniel is different angles of those four kingdoms as we work through Daniel. So tonight we're going to see the same four kingdoms that we saw back in Daniel chapter 2, but this time they're going to be presented as beasts, okay, rather than a statue. And so we see them from a different way. We get more input, more insight into these kingdoms. Um, but that's important because the kingdoms are mentioned several times throughout the scripture in Daniel, and they're presented in different ways. And so we want to jump in here. Notice chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Um, again, I can imagine him having to write it down. He knew it was from the Lord, but also, if you don't write it down, you won't remember. You ever had a dream, you wake up and think, I'll remember that forever, and the next morning, you don't remember it at all. So you got to write it down if you want to remember it. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea. Now, there's some symbols that are used here. There's some pictures, and this is important to understanding prophecy. Um, Scripture is not hard to understand. Prophecy is not hard to understand if you know how God wrote it. A lot of people stumble at prophecy because they don't understand the symbolism in Scripture. But God has done it and written it in such a way that if you understand it, it's very easy to understand all the way through the Bible. It's like the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a very easy book to understand. A lot of people, it's so hard, and I don't get it. And I, some people, I'll never even teach you because it's so hard. No, if you know all of the consistent symbols throughout the Bible, it's very simple. You simply take those symbols that God uses the same way throughout the Bible, and you plug them in in Revelation. We do the same thing here. Again, we talked about that on Sunday. It's what theologians call expositional constancy in hermeneutics, which is just the art of interpreting the Bible. And all that means is, is as you expose the Bible, you're constant. You've heard me say that a lot, but I, I think it's important because, for example, you'll see certain symbols used in Scripture. Now, um, two things will happen when these symbols are used. Sometimes they're literal. Sometimes they are the symbol for what that means. So how do we know the difference? Context. Context. You read what's before it, you read what's after it. So now we're going to see these four beasts, four winds rather, stirring up the great sea. Well, again, in context, we're going to see, especially these beasts that come out of the sea, we're going to realize this is not talking about the ocean or literal wind. It has a literal meaning, but it's using the literal symbolism. And that is throughout the Bible, expositionally, when it's not a literal sea, it means a sea of peoples. It means a large group of peoples. And you see that all through uh, the book of Daniel. You'll see a great sea. It means a large number of people. Um, again, if it's literal, then that'll be brought out in, in the scripture as well in the context. Uh, if it's literal wind, then God will make that clear. But if it's just winds, it'll show that God is stirring or the enemy is stirring to bring these together. And these beasts we're going to see are not animals coming up out of the ocean. They are the symbols that were used in Daniel chapter 2 of the different kingdoms. But now they're being presented as beasts. So what it's saying is... Out of all the peoples of the earth, 
things will be stirred up and these kingdoms will rise, okay? And so it's consistent all the way through the Bible so you can rest confident in, in, in how you interpret it. Again, Jesus did the same thing in uh, Matthew 13 when he gave the, started giving the parables. And they were like, Lord, what do you mean by these parables? He said, if you don't understand this one, you won't understand any of them. And, when, and if you look at the parables, you'll find out all of the same symbols are used and they all mean the same thing throughout all the gospels. So what Jesus was teaching them is the same thing he's showing us tonight. I am consistent. I don't confuse you. I give you the understanding. You just have to look at context to see is it literal or is it symbolic. If it's symbolic, it's still literal. It's just, it's just the symbol, it, it, the, the literalness of it is being shown symbolically. All right? So anyway, saw the four winds of heaven. I said we weren't going to go into detail. I can't. I just can't stop. <laughs> the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So the, we see the, the earth being stirred, the peoples of the earth being stirred. And four great beasts came up from the sea. That is, of the sea of peoples on the earth, these four beasts came up in his vision, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, uh, had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Uh, again, he's going to describe these in a minute, but this again talks about Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, uh, he went crazy for a while, thought he was an animal. He was restored, and he got a man's heart again. He, he, his wisdom came back to him. So he's talking about the first kingdom, which was the Babylonian kingdom, and Nebuchadnezzar again was the lion that was given, to, given the man's heart when his senses were restored. We saw that earlier in the book of Daniel. And suddenly, another beast, we know this is now the Medo-Persian Empire historically, a second beast like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, showing its strength, and they had said to it, arise and devour much flesh. So why was it raised up on one side? We know that the second empire after uh, Nebuchadnezzar's and Babylon was the Medo-Persian empire. And, and the Medo-Persian empire, the Medes were stronger. That's why it's the Medo-Persian empire and not the Persian Medo empire. So it's raised up on one side showing the Medes were stronger than the Persians, although they shared the kingdom. Verse six, after this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, remember, the third kingdom we now know historically was the Greek kingdom, Alexander the Great. And why would Alexander be shown as a leopard? Because Alexander conquered the world so quickly. He conquered cities so quickly. It was Alexander where we get Blitzkrieg from. We hear Blitzkrieg, we think of Germany, right? But actually, they stole that from uh, the Greek empire, from uh, Alexander. He's the one that made the Blitzkrieg famous, and that is... He would go in so fast, he would overwhelm the enemy by surprise and just take the city over. I mean, he conquered cities like that. And so he's pictured as a leopard, which is a very quick animal. Having four wings makes it even faster. And the four wings and the four heads, though, also uh, tell us uh, giving the future to Daniel. But now we can look back in history and see that after uh, Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided up between his four strongest uh, uh, captains. So it, we see the four heads being the picture. Now we know historically these four leaders that took four regions, they divided the earth up into, into quarters, if you will. And they led these quarters and they were these wings and they were these four heads after Alexander. Again, we're looking back because now we know history. Remember, Daniel, Daniel's looking forward. None of this had happened yet, but we can now look back and see what Daniel was talking about. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast. Now we come to the, the, um, the last of, the, of the, the statue and the beast. This is the Roman Empire. Notice this, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the, even the residue, he's saying, with the feet. So even what it didn't conquer immediately, it would go back and, and stomp with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now again, horns are a picture in Scripture of strength. We also know the ten horns represent these ten kingdoms that are going to make up this last Roman Empire. Now, as we get into this last beast, again, he goes back and forth between the, the, the Rome that happened 2,000 years ago and the future Rome, okay? 2,000 years ago, you had emperors. You just had one at a time. The Bible tells us here and in Revelation, when, re, when Rome is revived in the last days, it'll be broken up into 10 different regions by 10 different kings and those 10 different leaders. So we see the 10 horns. Horns in Scripture represent strength. So they'll be the strength of the earth, Ruling the earth in these 10 regions, these 10 kings, if you will. Uh, ruling the earth, 10 kings, it probably will be 10 regions, but definitely 10 kings, either way, for sure, represented by the 10 horns. He says, I was considering the horns, that is these kings, these leaders of these kingdoms, and there was another horn, a little one. Now, now we see the Antichrist coming on the scene. The Antichrist is pictured in Scripture 
as really a, a political, political unknown, really. He's kind of a, an unknown to the world as a leader, is the way it's presented in Scripture. In other words, when this guy shows up, he won't be somebody that you recognize, okay? Um, I've had people ask me, you know, is this the Antichrist? Is that the Antichrist? Is that the Antichrist? You know, and somebody recently, is, you think Prince Charles is the Antichrist? It, it can't be. It's impossible, and here's why. This guy's an unknown. Prince Charles is pretty well known. But this guy is put in Scripture as a little horn. He comes out of nowhere. He rises up to the top quickly and takes power. And, and the power that he has is given to him by Satan, the Bible says. And so we see him, this other horn, this little one, coming up among these ten kings that are ruling in the last days. He comes up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So when he takes power, he's going to rise real quickly. And for whatever the reason, we don't know why, and we don't know which three, he's going to take three of those kings and remove them immediately. It'll probably be some type of political move. Maybe these three aren't in line with his last day's government that he wants to establish, but he's going to yank them out. He's not just going to remove those kings. He's going to remove these three by the roots. So these particular kingdoms apparently are going to be kind of just done away with and absorbed into the other kingdoms. Okay? So he's going to yank them out by the roots. And there in this horn, uh, this that is the Antichrist, were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. This is another question I've gotten recently. There's a teaching going on on the internet right now that the Antichrist is not really a person, it's a system. Maybe you've seen that if you're one of those out there looking at all the different teachings that are out there. The Antichrist is not a system. Very clearly, the Bible reveals the Antichrist is a person. He will be speaking pompous words. He will yank three of the other kings and remove them. Jesus said, um, you're going to reject me, but there's one coming after me. Him you will receive. So Jesus refers to the Antichrist as a him and as a person. And here we see Daniel saying the same thing. So don't get confused out there when you see some of these teachings that talk about the Antichrist being a new world system or whatever. It's not what, at all what the scripture says. He's literally a man. He'll be speaking pompous words, be very arrogant, very puffed up. He'd be a big mouth, in other words. He says, I watched until thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. Notice he's, he went through all four kingdoms all the way to Jesus here. Then he's going to go back and explain it. Uh, I saw till the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head uh, like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. So now we see the Lord's throne established for the thousand-year reign. Uh, notice his throne was like a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. That's interesting. I used to wonder, what does it mean, its wheels? Um, until I realized that the Ark of the Covenant actually had wheels on it. Um, and pictures, ancient pictures of the Ark of the Covenant had these wheels that were on the side of it and all that. And when you see uh, Ezekiel's vision, remember the Lord comes back and it shows him on his throne uh, in the vision. And it says there were wheels and underneath the wheels were angels, the cherubim or whatever. So he literally has... Uh, a throne with wheels and thunder under it that he rides around on. Sounds like a Harley Davidson to me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously, but I'm just trying to justify the fact that I ride one. But anyway, thunder and lightning under him. I love that. It's the heart of the Lord. And, uh, and so anyway, but it's got these wheels that are down there underneath. And so that's why it describes it, these wheels of fire. And notice what it says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. You know, the Bible says when we stand before the Lord that all the wood, hay, and stubble will burn away. And only, what's, only the gold and only what's left that really was of the Lord. If we did it of our own, if there's something that I did because I wanted to exalt myself, I want to make Mark look important or Calvary Chapel look important, well, that's just all going to, sorry, gone. It doesn't, it doesn't last. You may get a couple of people down here that go, oh, good job, that was good. Well, enjoy your reward because that's it. It's going to burn up in the fiery stream. But what you did that was truly of the Lord, as his spirit led, it's going to remain. It's going to be purified. And I think that's what we're seeing here, this fiery stream coming out. It's not a judgment, if you will. It's just more of a purifying of the believers as God purifies us. It issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. That's you. Did you know you're in the Bible? That's you. You're going to be ministering to the Lord and worshiping him and praising him. So thousands and thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. And the court was seated and the books were opened. Again, notice the books. We always think about, you know, we want our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But there are multiple books in God's library. Uh, we know that there are books of judgment. God writes everything down. Um, the good news is, if you have come to Jesus Christ, your book of judgment has been erased. Is that good news or what? I mean, that right there makes me happy. I'm like, just erase it all and nobody's going to say anything or know anything because I've got a lot to erase. Um, matter of fact, when God's done erasing my stuff, there's not going to be much left. But I don't care because as long as it's erased, I'm good. Um, yours is going to be erased as well. 
Um, there are other books where God writes down all the things you said about him that were good. Malachi. It says, the end of Malachi, and the Lord listened as they spoke about him, and he wrote down what they said. So if you've been bragging on Jesus today, he wrote it down in his father's book in his, in his library at home because he wants to remember what his kids said. He'll remember. I'm just using that as an analogy for us. But he writes down what the good things you say about him. He listens in and goes, I like that. Now, thank you. That was very nice. Thank you for thanking me. Thank you for acknowledging me. Thank you for sharing me with others. He writes it down. So those, that book's there. Uh, there will also be the book of life. So there are multiple books that are there. They're going to be opened. Now, here's the good news. If you are in the book of life, none of the other books will matter other than the one where you said good things about him because it's kind of nice to have all those written down up there for eternity or whatever. You know, I'm sure it's going to be eternal. Uh, but the things that were written down that have now been erased of the things you did that were sinful, they're gone. Um, and they're not going to be judged on that. But the people that don't receive Christ, guess what's still going to be in their books? If you don't receive Jesus Christ, all the things you've done wrong from childhood up are still written down in heaven. And God's going to open that book up one day. And if you say, but I was pretty good. Well, let's look at page 5,692. Let's start there. And let's work from there to page 20,506. And you did these things and that things. I mean, by the time we're done seeing what we've done, there's nobody can stand before the Lord and say, I should go to heaven. He's going to say, do I need to say any more? No. No, you don't. Now you see why I'm glad all mine's erased. And you better be glad yours is erased. And if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord... It's time to pull out the Lord's spiritual eraser because you don't want your book to be open before the Lord on that day. You want to stand before him and him say, well, no charges, clean slate, enter into the joy of the Lord. It's all paid for. And I was reminding someone this week as we were talking about the goodness of the Lord. I'm sure he was writing it down because we were talking about it. That's kind of nice to know. Um, but just talking about the fact that, you know what, when we, when, when we, the Lord writes these things, I mean, when the Lord records things and writes them down, you know, he remembers, he, all the bad stuff is gone. Only the good stuff remains that God says he's gonna, you know, do. But we need to understand that it's a legal document in heaven. In other words, if you're one of the personality types, and some of you are with this many of us here, okay? You have trouble letting go of your shame or what you did or how can God forgive me and I can't believe, oh no, and there's no way I could ever. You're having trouble letting go of it. Well, even if you can't let go of it, when you get there, nobody's gonna be able to find it. It legally, what it means in the language is when God talks about erasing our sins, it's something that's legally done and it's legally, it, when they say expunged here, you know, it may be something you could find if you, you know, went to enough records. There's no record to find. There's no, there's no leftover eraser marks. It's literally not there. So the thing you're worried about tonight, it, it doesn't show up anywhere in heaven. It only shows up in your mind. And so you need to remember that. And keep that in your heart when the enemy's beating you up and you should be ashamed and this and what. Yeah, but he took your shame on the cross. Yeah, you did it, but he paid for it on the cross. That's what the cross was all about. So legally in heaven, even if you tried to go to heaven and go, I deserve everything, Lord, you need to judge me. You say, I'm sorry, I can't because legally I'm bound to not do that. I, if I charge you, I've got to re reverse what Jesus did on the cross. So I, I really have no ability to charge you if I wanted to. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love it. So anyway, that's what he says here. Um, and that's what he's seeing here in the vision. God's showing him this, all this fiery stream coming for him, ministering. The books are open. And he says, I watched because of the sound of the pompous words. Here, you know, the, the, the Antichrist again, um, which the horn was speaking. And I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. So you see the beast, the actual the Antichrist beast, and the beast of these kingdoms, if you will, as well being referred to here. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, here's Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. I love that. I think literal clouds and also the cloud of witnesses that surround us right now. That's us and all the other believers. He came to the ancient of days. So we see now the father in some way here, the father and Jesus interacting, yet one, and that mystery we'll see in the Trinity when we arrive in heaven. We'll figure it out. And they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. So it shows the father now completing his promise. He told the Lord, I'm gonna give you a kingdom. We see in the scriptures that in Isaiah, he promised a kingdom. Uh, to Jesus. He now gives him that kingdom. That's what he's talking about here. He's going to rule the earth for a thousand years. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So we'll have a thousand years here with the Lord ruling on this earth because that has yet to be fulfilled. We're about to see all the Christmas cards with, uh, you know, um, 
talking about the Lord and, and all this, you know, and the, the, it says the, the, the government shall rest on his shoulder, right? That's never happened. The government has never rested. That is the earth's government, which is the context of that verse. The earth's government has never rested on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Now, he's over all things. We know that. He's God of everything. So he, he has all authority. But he's never ruled on the earth over the governments in person. So that promise is still yet to be fulfilled. Although it was, it was spoken of, he will again do this. The, uh, the angel said, he's going to do this. And it'll be during the thousand year reign. When he comes back, he'll rule and reign for a thousand years. But he mentions his dominion will never be taken away after that. Why? Because once the thousand years is done, then he destroys this heaven and this earth, right? And don't be confused when I say this heaven. Uh, there are three heavens. The heaven around us where the birds fly, the Bible says. The Bible says the second heaven is where all the stars are. And the Bible says the third heaven is God's home. So when he says he'll destroy the earth and the heaven, he's not destroying his own home. He's destroying the stars, the planets, our atmosphere, this earth. It'll all just be burned up. And is going to create a new heaven and a new earth where his dominion will continue on after the thousand year reign forever and ever and ever. Now, he doesn't tell us why he's destroying everything, but I have a theory. This is not the Bible. Again, this is Mark's theory. So separate Mark from the Bible. But this universe has been tainted by sin. You know, the fallen angels right now are flying in the atmosphere. They're demonic. They hate God. Uh, this earth is tainted by our sins and by all the wickedness. So I think the Lord's just going to wipe the slate clean and start a brand new thing that has never had any sin enter it. It'll be clean from beginning to end for the rest of eternity. And so either way, we'll find out the details when we get there, but his dominion will be forever and ever. So now he, he describes it, although I kind of walked you through it. He's going to you know, tell you what he says here, the angel. And I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. And I came near to one of those who stood by. Again, this is an angel in the vision. And I asked him the truth of all this. And he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. He says, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which will arise out of the earth. Again, Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, and Rome. Now we can look back and see that. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. That'll be us during the thousand-year reign. And shall possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. <laughs> That's great news. And then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. And this is interesting. This beast bothered Daniel more than any of them. Now, now again, and I want you to want to notice, it's the second rising of this beast that bothered Daniel, not the first one. The second, the second when, when Rome is revived, it's more fierce than the original Rome. Now, when Rome was in power, it was a fierce kingdom. You didn't mess with Rome. Uh, you messed with Rome, they just wiped you out and everybody that followed you. I mean, they were, they were rough. They didn't put up with anything. But what's interesting about this, this vision is he's saying when Rome is revived, this second leg of the Roman Empire of the, in the statue, it's going to be way worse than the first one. And this is the one that's bothering Daniel. He sees it and goes, what is this thing with these huge iron teeth and these iron claws and wiping out the entire planet, but even, even whatever's left over, crushing the residue? I mean, whatever this is, it's a fearful kingdom, um, which talks about the, the last days. We're getting a, a slight... We're getting slight headwinds of some ideas of what this kingdom may look like when you see the world today and the increase in violence around the world. Um, it's going to get so much worse than this. That's why I'm so excited about the removal of the church uh, in the rapture because it's going to get really, really ugly. And this is what he's seeing. And notice what he says. He says, this was different from all the other beasts. Not just dreadful, but exceedingly dreadful. With its teeth of iron, again, iron and bronze are metals of judgment in the Bible. Again, those are consistent symbols. Again, we talked about the, getting the literal meaning of the symbols used. So this is teeth of judgment and nails of judgment, uh, as God is going to be during that time, during the great tribulation, judging the earth that is rejected and once the church has been removed. So, but this kingdom will have teeth of iron, very strong, nails of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and trampled the residue. Again, even what was left with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head in this last day's one world government, and the other horn, the Antichrist, which came up before them, which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than its fellows. So you see the ten kings and then the Antichrist coming up, yanking three of the kings down, and again this last day's government taking over. He says, I was watching, and the same horn, that is this little horn, that is the Antichrist, the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Now, this is another reason I believe the church has to be gone. Because what did Jesus say about the church and the gates of hell? So the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. 
Right here, guess what's going to be prevailing against the saints? The Antichrist. That's why I believe we have to be gone because otherwise he couldn't prevail. The church is gone. These are those saved after the church. He will be able to prevail over them. Uh, many of them will be put to death, although they'll be true believers and they'll make it into heaven. We see in the book of Revelation, when they, those that come out of the great tribulation that know Christ, they're going to stand before the throne and say, Lord, how long until you judge the earth? How long until you judge the Antichrist? How long until you judge what they did, they did to us? He said, you know what? A little bit longer. Don't worry. A little bit longer. It says he closed them in a robe of white and tells them to hold on. They're going to have justice. But again, for those who miss the rapture, who don't get saved until after the rapture, um, they're going to be making their plea before the throne. It shows us in Revelation. But again, here he's going to be prevailing over those that are here at that time. Then this is during the great tribulation. Notice until he'll, he'll only prevail for the three and a half years there until the ancient of days came and the judgment was made in favor of the saints of the most high. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. Again, we know now the Roman empire, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the entire earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. Again, how do we know it's not talking about the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago? Because they never had ten kings at one time. See, this is, this is a different kingdom. That's how we know. There never was a time where ten emperors all ruled at once, and there wasn't somebody that came up and pulled three of the emperors down and then took over the other emperors. So, so it, and, and then we go back to Daniel's vision in chapter 2. Remember, the, the final kingdom had two legs. So that's how you, you get, how do you know which is which? You just go back, look at the original vision, look at what's saying here, see the difference in what happened in the Roman Empire, and now we see that he's jumped to the second half of the Roman Empire, the second leg, if you will, with these ten kings. He says again, um, the ten kings arise from the kingdom, another shall rise after them. Uh, he shall be different from the first ones. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Again, he's not only going to be just arrogant and speaking against the church. He's going to be speaking against the Lord. Remember, he's going to stand up, it says in Revelation, at that the three years before the second coming and say, literally, he's going to say, I'm God. Bow down to me. And everybody that doesn't bow down to him, it says he'll put him to death, except for those that escape. Who are those that escape? The Jews that flee down to Petra, it tells us, where God will supernaturally protect them as they flee from Israel and make it down to Petra, where God supernaturally protects them for three and a half years. But everybody else pretty much, I mean, there'll be others that survive, but it's going to be um, the majority of those that don't take the mark or bow down, he's going to put to death. And so he's going to not only be pompous in his own pride, he's going to speak against even God, pretending he's God, as Satan has always desired to be God. Remember, he said, I will ascend to the sides of the north. I will be this. I'll be like God, um, et cetera. And he shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. So again, he wants to change times and seasons, probably sacred occasions. That is, he wants to do away with, he'll do away with all other religions except worship of him. What you're going to see happen is when the Antichrist comes on the scene, there's going to be a one world religion, but it's going to be a one world religion. If we look at the original Roman Empire, the way that the emperors did it was the emperors allowed you to have your own religion as long as you acknowledge that the emperor was God. So you'd have to pinch incense 2,000 years ago. You'd pinch the incense, put it on an altar. You'd say, Caesar is Lord. And as long as you obeyed and were a good little boy or girl and acknowledge that Caesar was the Lord, which many of them actually claimed they were God. You get your certificate. You keep that certificate in case they ever ask you for your papers so you could prove it. And then you could go back and be a Christian or be a Jew or, or, or whatever religion you want to do, they would let you do as long as you acknowledge that, that Caesar was above all of it. So I believe what we're going to see when the Antichrist comes on the scene is the same thing. He's going to allow these, all the religions of the world. You'll see the major religions of the world will still be able to call themselves that and practice that as long as everybody kind of agrees that they get along you know, in, in some form of one religion like pinching the incense to Caesar, there's going to be something that kind of links all the religions together. Um, and that's why I said we, the true church is going to have to be out of here at that time because we'd never do that, right? So, but that's going to happen. And then once those three and a half years go by and a bunch of more believers get saved during that time because the church will be gone, then you have a whole new group that gets saved. That's when he's going to demand that all religions are dropped. You can't, you can't be a Christian. You can't be a Muslim. You can't be Hindu. You can't be anything. It's you've got to worship the Antichrist. And if you don't, you're put to death. Um, so he's going to tend to change the times and laws, no doubt referring to uh, that to some degree. And then the saints shall be given into his hand. Notice this, for three and a half years, for time, times, and half a time. That's the Bible's way. Time in the Bible is it prophetically is consistently one year. 
times means two years, and a half a time is half a year, so you have three years. I'm sorry, three and a half years. So uh, again, remember that, that three and a half years, again, where the, the saints are going to be turned over, and he actually will prevail against them. He won't prevail against the church, because the church will be gone. But he will prevail against the believers on the earth that get saved after the church is removed for that three and a half years. But here's the good news. Uh, 26, but the court shall be seated. That is the court of the Lord at the end of all this. And they shall take away his dominion. That is the Antichrist dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the most high. The kingdom is going to be given to you. Think about that for a minute. Remember Jesus said this, it is the father. He said, he said, you know, sheep, he told his little sheep, you know, don't worry. It is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Isn't that amazing? Now, he's the Lord over all the kingdom. But when your dad's the king, pretty cool. You know, you kind of rule with him in the family. And that's what it's going to be. He's going to give you guys the kingdom. So you guys are going to be ruling. Remember chapter 1 of Revelation? It says that those that are in Jesus Christ are kings and priests. So you're going to be kings. And you're going to be priests. The world has no idea who you guys are. Now, we have to, again, not to be taken. Some people take this and get really prideful with it. I've seen even within the church, people get prideful, you know, and I'm a child of the king and whatever. No, we need to be humble. It's not about being prideful about anything. But the reality is you're going to be a king one day. Uh, You're going to be a priest unto the Lord one day. And you're going to be ruling the earth with Jesus. He's the ultimate king and leader. You're just going to be working in different areas of the kingdom, working with him um, as a part of his family. And so very exciting when you think about it and really kind of lay out what's going to be happening. Um, But he says, it shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's us. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. Um, This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed. Again, because he was concerned about that fourth beast. He says, but I kept the matter in my heart. Next week, we'll jump on in chapter 8. I'm not going to do any more than 7 tonight. And I know I went through that rather quickly. Um, I told you I wasn't going to take a lot of time. I had to explain some things where it would make no sense, especially if you're new to prophecy. Uh, If you want to go through the book of Daniel, uh, we have it online. You can go through. I go into a lot more detail all through the book and give you all the symbols and all that work through in Revelation as well. You can find that online. So uh, don't don't let that stumble you or or, or set you back if you you didn't follow everything. But here's the bottom line. The Lord's coming back to rule and reign. We're going to rule and reign with him, and it's going to be awesome. So I just summed up chapter 7. That's the Cliff Notes version. But guys, you know, again, we have a lot to look forward to. Now, in this world right now, and I'm going to finish quickly. I don't want to take up our time here for communion, but I'm going to say this. There's a lot of darkness in the world around us, is there not? There's a lot of reasons for people to be fearful and be worried. Guys, if you can keep your eyes on what we just read tonight and the glory that's coming soon, um, although we may... um, go through the birth canal of persecution. Jesus said it's like a woman in birth pangs. He's the one that gave that description. Although we may go through some of that before the rapture of the church, we don't know how much of the contraction stuff we're gonna go through or whatever. Guys, the reward afterwards, it's gonna seem like nothing. Paul said the suffering down here is compared to what's waiting, nothing. Now to us, it seems like a lot. He said, you wait till you see what I saw. Because remember, he went to the third heaven. He said, no worries, guys. Rejoice, rejoice. There's great things coming ahead. So be encouraged. You have a great future if you know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, make that decision tonight. You know, confess your sin to the Lord. Tell him you believe he died for you on the cross. Turn from your sin. Give your life to him. And what a great time to do it right before we have communion. And then you can understand what true communion is because it represents that oneness and relationship that we have with the Lord. So let's pray and ask God now to um, bless our time in this oneness and communion and his teaching tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for Daniel chapter 7, and we thank you that you've shown us the future, that we have something to hope for, God. The world around us is hopeless right now. Anger fills the uh, streets, um, or disappointment, fear, and yet you've given us joy, joy and rejoicing. Again, the world can't understand it. Lord, I don't even fully understand it, but I, I love it. And I thank you for the joy that you give us. I thank you for the hope that you give us and the promise that we have. And Lord, we see that you've been so true to your word throughout history. You're not going to change now. You will not fail now. And so let us take heart in that. Lord, if there's any fear for hearted tonight, let them rejoice and and remove their fear. God, your word says perfect love casts out all fear. If there's any here, Lord, tonight who don't know you, I pray they'd make that decision so they can understand what it means 
to not only lose that fear, but to know the king of the universe. So we thank you, Lord. We bless you. God, we thank you for tonight and your word. And now we prepare ourselves, Lord, uh, to remember your body and your blood in communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, as